American steam locomotives had been fueled by wood, oil, and coal in their 125-year existence. But by 1955, most rail lines could turn a greater profit by scrapping steam giants and replacing them with modern diesel locomotives. Virginia's Norfolk and Western Railway thought differently. N and W territory stretched from Norfolk, Virginia to Cincinnati, Ohio, and traversed some of the richest coal mining country in America. Getting that coal to market was a priority for the Norfolk and Western. This railroad, more than any other, refined the use of coal-powered steam in its engines. The magic of the Norfolk and Western really was a uh, uh, dedicated company policy to building uh, efficient locomotives. They were designed by NAW personnel and they were built right in Roanoke shops to their own designs and specifications and tailored to the particular operating conditions of the Norfolk and Western. They defined a modern steam locomotive as one that could operate with a minimum of maintenance and a high degree of availability. The N&W operated slow-speed coal drags, high-speed freight trains, and swift passenger service. It perfected one type of engine for each specific duty. As far as I'm concerned, the North and Western has built three of the best locomotives in the world. They are all simplified and powerful locomotives. They will haul and they will run and they will do almost anything you want them to do. Economical too. We had hills and we had mountains, but we could run. The railroad's premier heavy tonnage hauler was the 2882Y-class locomotive. This basic Malay type was originally conceived by the N&W and then adopted by the United States Railroad Administration. The USRA was formed during World War I to regulate and improve performance on America's railroads. It championed 12 modern locomotive designs to aid the war effort. The 2882 was one design that the N&W borrowed back and improved on for 35 years. The Norfolk Western had steep hills, heavy tonnage, and sharp curvature. They wanted a locomotive that would be comfortable hauling tonnage up mountains from 15 to 25 miles an hour. They refined their 2882s over the years until they came up with a locomotive that had the perfect characteristics for what they needed, getting all the horsepower that the locomotive was capable of producing. What the North and Western wound up with was a locomotive that could produce the power of a big boy at 25 miles an hour, but do it by using steam twice. The Norfolk and Western took a locomotive 20% lighter than a big boy and gave it nearly 30% greater starting power. At 25 miles an hour, both locomotives had equal horsepower. The N&W excelled at doing more with less. When it came to moving fast freight or large passenger trains over mountains, the N&W triumphed with another innovative locomotive design, the A-Class. These were 2664 locomotives, not a common wheel arrangement. And at the time they were built, there was nothing on rails that was comparable. These locomotives produced a transportation record that probably is as good as any, any steam locomotive ever built. They wound up hauling trains of 16,000 tons of coal from Williamson, West Virginia to Portsmouth, Ohio. And, uh, less than four hours running to This is 112 miles under full throttle operation on a tender full of coal. I don't know that a big boy could have done it. I don't think the Allegheny could have done it. And I don't know what else would, would be capable of it. The Norfolk and Western perfected a third type of locomotive in their famed Roanoke shops. A 484 wheel arrangement was commonly referred to as a northern type, but in the heart of Virginia, these southerners preferred to call their locomotive the J. 
There were only 14 Jays, but they were really the crown jewel of the NNW insofar as passenger power was concerned. And although uh, taste is a matter of uh, personal choice, uh, a lot of people think they were the most tastefully streamlined locomotive ever built. They had an aerodynamic look about them, and yet they retained the essential dynamic elements of the steam locomotive. And the one feature that was particularly significant about them was the lightweight reciprocating parts. And that was one of the secrets of their ability to be able to operate at high speed, although they were primarily a mountain engine. A Jay's machinery was so well designed and its balance so precise that two people could reportedly push it on level track. It was another source of pride on a railroad fired by prideful achievement and coal. That was a feeling which went throughout the Norfolk and Western system. Uh, the pride in their locomotives which were designed by their own people, uh, built in their own shops, and built for a particular uh, purpose. The Norfolk and Western uh, stuck with the steam locomotive longer than any other major, major railroad in the country and was the last major road to uh, dieselize. They uh, gave steam its, its best effort and uh, most success in the last 25 years of operation. People loved the Norfolk and Western. All the employees you never found us saw it. Never one of them. They all loved their jobs, and they loved the railroads, and they treated the railroad as their own personal property. Commercial photographer O. Winston Link loved the Norfolk and Western steam giants. He began his career in New York and eventually combined his photography with a childhood fascination with trains. Link's one-of-a-kind snapshots of steam trains are renowned in both the railroad and art worlds. The coming of the diesel era in the 1950s prompted him to document the twilight years of the NNW steam giants. I was seeing headlines in magazines and newspapers that one railroad after another had lost steam, so I decided I had to do something. I was being forced into it. And Norfolk and Western was the only one left that's 100% steam. When I started work there in 1955, I had 450 steam engines to work with of all different classes. It was paradise for a photographer, for anyone that loves steam engines. There's just nothing you could ask for better than that. Link excelled in the art of night photography. He used massive banks of flash bulbs to capture stunning, eerie, and sometimes bizarre images of people and trains. He witnessed the end of an era, men working with their giant machines for the last time. Everybody liked the railroad, and they all depended on it. They loved it. They went out right outside their house, just with a few feet of their living room. They didn't care, they, they loved all the engineers, they knew all the crew, they knew everybody on it. Steam engines held the place together and everybody loved them, and they loved the railroad. I regret that I wasn't able to spend more time in a locomotive shop, where you see the machinery that was used to make a locomotive. The other thing that I would like to have done would have worked with the mechanical engineers that did the design work on a on a lot of the, the work that went into these steam engines because they were geniuses. After years of stoking the flames of coal-fired steam, even the Norfolk and Western was forced to concede to the economic superiority of diesel locomotives. In 1960, the railroad stopped running the last regularly scheduled steam train in America. It's probably an ironic bit of history that some of the last duty performed by these huge locomotives very often was pulling coal, the very fuel that they burned. There's a line from Shakespeare, I think, which sums it up uh, pretty well, and that is a line about being consumed by that which it was nourished by, and very literally, the steam locomotive was doing uh, just that. 
Steam engines vanished and took with them the livelihoods of the men and women who built and ran them. Dealing with this loss would be the railroader's greatest challenge.